Man, get up here in the Zoloft to get your head right. Hi there, and welcome to the Zoloft. I know, I know. How would black folks feel if there was a white history month, or heck, why not a Mexican history month, or Asian history month, or Native American history month, or Middle Eastern history month, etc.? We could just have a year-round celebration of American history now, couldn't we? Woo, wouldn't that be nice? Now, since Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and the Google have been limiting the reach of my biz, I've been feeling like I've been talking to myself about all this stuff. So I invited some homies over to the Zoloft. Remotely, but you get the point. And we're going to talk a little bit about Black History Month. One of my guests is white, and she's not going to act like she's all hip to black history and culture. Because even if she did, the haters would probably accuse her of cultural appropriation or something. She's a God-fearing patriot, and she's as sweet as she is, lovely and talented. And yes, yeah, she's one of those rare, outed Hollywood conservatives who's sick of tyrannical liberals. She'd be like, yeah, y'all can go eat a butt sandwich. I'm a conservative. What? And we'll also be joined by a man who could really go upside your head with some history. And I bet even Carter G. Woodson himself would love to give this dude one of them long soul brother handshakes. Heck, I bet you would too. I hope y'all stick around for the rest of the video and pass it around too. All right, friends, welcome to the Zoloft. I've got visitors in the Zoloft. I've got, in the Zoloft with me, I've got Tracy Milk. Did I say that right? Ah, oh, yeah. Tracy <laughs> Melchior. There it is. There you go. Got it out. Nice. Tracy Melchior is with us, and uh, she, she's got the book, Breaking the Perfect Ten. She's in that movie, Do You Believe? And Soap Opera Fame. What is that? The Bold and the Beautiful? And, and, and notice that. Now, she's going to come to the Zoloft, and notice that she didn't even have to try to pull the, the Rachel Dolezal thing. Yeah, blacks and whites in harmony, but I really don't believe that crap because I feel like I have to be black to be around black people. Ain't that right, Sean King? Yeah, I'm a pot of donut. She just came in as she is, and she's gonna she's gonna have a conversation with a couple of black folks, and 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 we can actually have this dialogue and be constructive with it without shouting over saying, "Be quiet, privileged white devil." Equitu. And also I have in the Zoloft with me, I've got former Congressman, Lieutenant Colonel Alan West. Alan West? Oh, it's the big one. Lamont, mix me up a heart attack tonic of aspirin and ripple. Call it aspirin ripple. Just, just all around stud meter breaker, Alan West. Now, I mean, you, you be very kind. You believe this guy? He takes the time to hang out with a knucklehead like me. And I'm very kind. The question I'm going to kick off with uh, with Black History Black History Month is: Does it do more harm than good? Do we still need it? Now, and if I could pose that question to you, Alan, do we do we still need Alan? Uh, uh, yeah, we still need, we still need Alan West. Uh, do we still need Black History Month? And does it do more harm than good? Well, I think it's very important that we have a Black History Month. I think it's important that we take a, a, an opportunity to reflect back upon the accomplishments of our forefathers and foremothers. But the end result is, where do we go from here? You know, when I sit back and I remember the State of the Union address when the, President Trump talked about the incredible historic record low for Black unemployment and the Congressional Black Caucus just sat there. I mean, that is not the reflection of what Black History Month should be. So, who is the one that is out there dictating the narrative from Black History Month? That would be me, honey. Who is out there saying, you know, these are the people that we should be reflecting upon? Still me. And I think that we really lost that to the progressive socialists or the, the radical black agenda that is out there, the Black Lives Matter crowd, which is just, you know, uh, funded by George Soros. So they're the ones that are dictating the narrative. You know, I've, I've taken an opportunity and I put out a podcast a couple of weeks ago to talk about, you know, Booker T. Washington. I mean, that's my ideological hero. And I think that that's the person that we should reflect upon because, you know, his whole, uh, you know, reason for establishing Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute was about education, entrepreneurship, and self-reliance. And I think that that's what we need to get back to. So I think it is important to still have a Black History Month, but the more important thing is who is dictating the narrative. That's that's where uh, my concern is. Excellent. Yeah. Tracy, what say you? I think it's great to honor and, you know, cheer for the accomplishments. And you mentioned some other great black leaders that we should be cheering in your article I read online. But I think it's become where we're not cheering for them. It becomes about booing white people. You know, kind of like when you talk about in your article about Nancy Pelosi, you know, all she could talk about was what a shameful racist Trump is. Well, I, I don't think we ever make ourselves look good by trying to make other people look bad. And if it became just, you know, about celebrating accomplishments, that'd be one thing. But if it's just about shaming white people, I think that's where it's becoming um, less productive. Equitable. I, and I agree wholeheartedly. 
and that's the whole thing is that and let's let's broaden this kind of it is not about black history month but think about hispanic history month women's history whatever yeah. but you know these things have been hijacked by the progressive socialist left and it's their narrative that they're getting out there and really it's a narrative of victimization it's a narrative of of economic uh, enslavement not economic empowerment and so i think that if we're going to continue to have these type of recognitions it's very important that we uh, ha have some people that have an objective perspective look one of the things about the quote-unquote african american museum up in uh, washington dc think about some of the people that aren't in that uh, uh you know museum of history i mean you don't have clarence thomas there and so wow. we have a generation that's going through and they don't know who clarence thomas is or condoleezza rice uh, very very little is mentioned about the general colin powell i mean so the, the, the thing that is happening in america is with identity politics and this demographic collectivism you have the left dictating the narrative that is being told to everyone you know being hispanic being in black being women you know lgbt whatever uh and so we've got to get back to you know retaking these 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 celebrations and these recognitions and being objective about them. excellent excellent you know and, and the thing if i may say about uh, uh black history month it's not so much that hey look at us we're black and we need to be celebrated there was an institution that kept black people from you know achieving look here i want to be an astronaut you can't be an astronaut you're black well why can't black folks go up into space is black up there and what we celebrate with black history is that despite these institutions that were put in place to keep black people from achieving, you have those who still achieve. You have blacks who went from slavery to uh, uh, repre uh, representatives of the republic. So, you know, when you, when you look at things like that, if you look at, at the things that were stacked up against them, these of course would be things to be honored. But today, <clears throat> we don't have that kind of diversity. As much as many people will try to say that we do, we don't. And it's not something that, it's, it, for lack of a better word, it's almost embarrassing. It's like, really, are you, you really want to put yourself in the shoes of those who faced real adversity and try to make icons out of people who really haven't faced these kinds of things? That's those who have. Now, in that, it's like, yeah, those who still carried out that American spirit and say, you know what, this is my country too. And despite whatever adversity you're going to bring to me, I'm still going to go for mine. I'm still going to make my stand. That, of course, is to be commended, but you know, I think, I think a lot of that, just like you said, Alan, it's like we got people who are not being recognized despite adversity that they've come up against. And unfortunately, they're not placed in uh, this uh, historical setting because they don't qualify. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, having retired from 22 years in the United States military, I think about some of those men that made it possible for me to be here. You know, the, the movie Glory talked about, you know, the first time black were able to wear the uniform of this nation, the 54th Massachusetts. You have uh, the 9th and 10th Cavalry, the Buffalo Soldiers, and what they were able to do in the expansion of the United States of America out west and, and protecting people that uh, they couldn't even stay in the same towns uh, that they were helping these people get to. Or you talk about the Harlem Hellfighters, the 369th Infantry Regiment out of New York. The fact that, you know, they were not going to be allowed to fight on the front lines, and the French said, we'll take these guys and the French gave them the war cross recognition or the Tuskegee Airmen or the uh, the Montford Point Marines oh and there's the Red Ball Express which my grandfather was assigned to for anybody who was wondering what this picture is up on my wall so that's what I would like to see, you know, the Black History Month be about, truly educating people about these historic moments and these historic achievements. I have never seen anything done about Charles Drew, who discovered blood plasma. Black you up. George Washington Carver, all the great experiments that he did at Tuskegee with the, with the peanut. So those are the things. I, you know, when I see people going out and celebrating Tupac Shakur or, you know, uh, Michael Brown from Ferguson or Trey but, you know, that's that's a political ideological agenda item. That is not truly what this month should be about. Everything he just said is silly. Can I have your bubble gum when you're done with it? So now, Tracy, do we need, yes. um, should we have a, a white history month? Awkward. Well, you know what? I Googled White History Month and it was interesting what came up. What came up is why they're, why you shouldn't ask that. <laughs> why you shouldn't even be asking about a White History Month and why I'm not aligned to even be asking it. Um, but 
the argument is is that everything else is about white history so apparently the feeling is we get the other 11 months and you guys got the one shortest month <laughs> now, if I, now to, to that to the shortest month the, the the narrative is is that oh for black history month they uh the, the white folks gave us the shortest month of the year and it's like well, well hold on when carter g woodson made you know black history week it was just supposed to be for a week. So if you right. blame white people for that, blame Carter G. Woodson, <clears throat> and he chose February because he wanted to co coincide with Lincoln's birthday and Frederick Douglass's birthday. In yeah. I hope y'all get tossed into a big bowl of macaroni salad and eaten by Godzilla. You know, when you talk about these great black men in history, they were overcoming such adversity and accomplishing so much. And accord, like what you were saying off on so these days, there's not as much, right? We can agree that there is not the same oppression that there was Frederick Douglass time, MLK, all of those times. And yet I feel like people are using it as more of an excuse now than they did then. I will agree. Uh, and I think that that is a fault of, of having the history. And, you know, I, I grew up down south in Georgia. And when you sit and, you know, you listen to your parents or you listen to the grandparents or some of the old folks you go down to see uh, down in South Georgia when you're visiting your relatives, you know, they, they had those tough times. But it was through their resilience, it was through their perseverance, through their faith in God that, uh, uh, you know, they wanted to make something better for subsequent generations. And I think that right now we have a current generation, and I'll say, you know, very honestly, in the black community, they're so focused on the contrived uh, grievances that are out there, this, this victimization, you know, that they place upon themselves, that they really don't understand what adversity is. You know, it's so funny. I, you, you always have people say, hey, you know, Carl West, man, I'm having a really bad day. And I, and I look at it and I say, you know what a really bad day is a really bad day is when you're in a firefight with the Taliban and you're running low on ammunition and they're still shooting at you you know everything has to be put in perspective so when you think about Harriet Tubman or you think about you know the, the Frederick Douglass's the Booker T Washington's you go all the way back to a person like a Christmas addicts or those men of the 54th Massachusetts or even the Tuskegee Airmen and you start to put these things in perspective and you say hey look these people sacrifice so you can have so many great opportunities Opportunities, but yet you're falling for a narrative. You're falling for a line that puts you in, in, in a certain type of bondage that's even worse than the physical bondage because it is destroying your will. It's destroying your determination. When I look at what is happening in the black community where we have decimated the family uh, to the point where now only about 24% of black kids are in two-parent households, this is not how we were meant to be. This is not, you know, what, what the, the foundation of a community community was family that got us through all of these hard, adverse uh, situations and times, but yet we have fallen asunder to a certain uh, policy agenda, and you know it is causing an erosion from within. So I think it is very important that we have these dissenting voices that don't allow uh, you know the loud screaming you know voices as uh, Zoe was talking about to be the ones that are heard and and really the ones that get the the greater platform because because. <laughs> We're not living in any real adversity. I mean, when you talk about, I, I've been to Afghanistan. I've seen poverty. I've seen people have to walk to get, you know, fresh water. But when you are living in certain places here, you still have, uh, you know, uh, cable TV and a car. And, uh, you know, you're able to go to the <laughs> nail salon and get your nails done. That ain't poverty. Right. Yeah. Let me tell you a thing or two about being broke and being in poverty and having a bad day under enemy fire, Mr. West. Yeah, and I think if Black History Month was about if these men could overcome what they overcame, look at what you could possibly do. And I guess what the overall consensus here is, is that that narrative has been hijacked to look at these evil white people and what they did to these people in our history. And then it's kind of turning it 
into, you know, an anger and a, a negative connotation rather than a positive celebration of, of black history. And you know, that, Tracy, it's so interesting you bring that point up because the evil white people then are still the party of the same evil white people today, you know, and, and it's funny that no one wants to, to bring that out. And I really think that's why you, you see the left wanting to whitewash history, revisionist history. They don't want to talk about the Civil War because all of a sudden we come to realize, well, it was those Democrats that voted against the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. It was, you know, the Democrat Party that started the Ku Klux Klan. It was the Democrats, lynchings, the poll tests, uh, poll taxes, literacy tests, all of those things. Uh, and so they don't want to own up to their history. And, and it was the Great Society programs of Lyndon Johnson that has destroyed the community. It was, you know, Robert uh, Grand Wizard uh, Bird, uh, the, the Ku Klux Klan member that was praised by Barack Obama and Hillary and Bill Clinton, or Al Gore Sr., who was against the civil rights legislation. So they really don't want to have that discussion. So when you talk about the evil white people, I find it very funny. It's, it's, it's the same ones throughout this history have been doing it, except it's gone from physical bondage to economic bondage. We Democrats don't have anything to hide. Emails? What emails? Um, yeah. You know, when it comes down to you know history, which is something that we always, we always want to reflect on, we always want to look back on this, but, but we're going for policies that are, are making us history instead of really doing things that make history. Yeah. And, you know, and, and uh, excellent point, you know, Alan, and of course, you know, the retort to that is that supposedly the party suicides and uh, and that there was a, uh, and, it, and when they get cornered on that, then they go to the ideological switch. But, you know, I want, I want to reflect on, you know, speaking of history, I want to reflect on the sentiments of uh, John Wood, John Wood's book himself. And if I'm, I'm going to paraphrase, when you look at, at his manifest, manifesto, so to speak, before he, before he committed that, uh, or, you know, in, in uh, the Commission of Zach, you know, he, his whole thing, he, he says, this is the white man's land. It wasn't made for the black man. And, and as, but as far as he's concerned, he would love to do things for the black race. He, and meaning that I would love to ration liberty to black people. In other words, he had a better idea. He had a better plan for black people. And in his manifesto, he's slandering Republicans and trying to make Republicans out to be the enemy, the real detriment to the black community, the real detriment to the Negro slaves. This is all this is all in John Wilkes Booth's cinema. And you can see that reflected in Democrats today. It's the same. They try to say that they switched. They did not switch. Their sentiments are still the same. They know what's best for Negro. They're going to ration out liberties and whatever entitlements to Negro. And the Republicans are the real enemy. It's the same stuff all the way down to the morbid hatred they have for Republicans. I hear it all. I hear it all the time. It's like whenever you bring up what you brought up, Alan, and what so is bringing up now about the history of the Democratic Party versus the Republican, is they say that, like what you said, it was the switch. It's that I, you know, the Republicans don't understand history. That the Republicans then are what the, were the Democrats of yesterday, and and that kind of thing. Well, and and again, that's that's what I'm saying here in this month, or in history period, it's, it's been hijacked by an error. You know, growing up down south, here's the real thing that happened. When Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was in prison in Birmingham, that was at the time period of Kennedy running against Nixon in the presidential election. And they asked Richard Nixon to to make a phone call just to offer condolences or sympathies to uh, Coretta Scott King. And he did not do that because he, quote unquote, he did not want to upset the, the Southern whites. Well, the rumor got out that John F. Kennedy did. Never been confirmed, but the rumor got out that he called. And so then all of a sudden, I can tell you, growing up down south, there were three pictures in every living room of every house uh, of, of a black family. It was Jesus, it was Martin Luther King Jr. and John F. Kennedy. And that was the switch. But then again, also, no one knows. It was the, the Senate Republicans, Everett Dirksen, who enabled the civil rights legislation to pass. It was not the real intent of, of Lyndon Johnson to, to get the civil rights legislation to pass. And again, he was fighting against Robert Byrd and Al Gore Sr. Uh, and so they saw that as a leverage so that they could get a, a consistent voting electorate. And that's what they have had. So I'm happy to have those discussions. And as soon as you bring those points up, then people start, you know, they start to yell and the screaming and everything because you have that historical background. In fact, just the same as you look at someone like a Margaret Sanger. 
you know, Margaret uh, Sanger was about. a white supremacist. Margaret Sanger was a racist. Margaret Sanger spoke at Klan, Klan rallies. She was the one that founded Planned Parenthood. Yeah. And there's a large percentage of Planned Parenthood clinics are located where? In the black oh. communities because she referred to blacks as weeds and undesirable. See, and that's the type of thing that should be discussed in Black History Month. Uh, and, and, and not, you know, the, the, the flowery talk, the, the, the certain specific politicized narratives, but truly saying, okay, what is happening in our communities? Why, why do we not have quality education? Who are the people that are against school choice and school vouchers and charter schools? Who are the people that are against, you know, black entrepreneurship and small business growth? But for whatever reason, we never have those discussions. And so these 28, 29 days will pass by and guess what? Nothing ever gets solved. Uh-huh. Yeah. And you know what, if it's true, you know, I mean, for me, it's like, first off, I, I believe in rooting for your team, not booing the other. And I feel like basically black history month well, has been, if, if Tennessee's playing Alabama, I'm booing <laughs> Alabama. Okay. I'm just sorry. All right. I'm all right we can draw the best. line there. But, um, yeah. And I guess if I'm, you know, the ducks are playing, I, the Kings, I boo the Kings, I guess. Okay. I'm guilty of that. But for the most part, I, if, if black history month would be more about cheering your team rather than booing the opponent as a, or the viewed opponent, um, I think that it would be more widely received and recognized productive. and productive and helpful. Yeah. Um, because as a parent, one of the things I think about is let's say that's true, that there is an Achilles heel as a black person, okay? So if my kid has a handicap, I hear people that have kids that are either physically or mentally challenged and they're encouraging them that they can do whatever they want in spite of it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that to constantly focus on the adversity and, you know, that kind of thing is not helping anybody. It's not helpful. You know, they, um, what do they say? Obstacles are the things you see when you take your eye off the goal. It's like it's fo- focusing on the obstacle, not the goal. And so I, I would really love to see more of this, you know, Black History Month as a celebration. Like, is there a parade? Right here, honey. I'm not into the parades. I know that President Trump likes military parades. I hated marching, okay? Soldiers hate marching. So, President Trump, if you're watching the Zoloft, just understand, we don't want parades. And, and so, uh, you know, we don't need these grandiose celebrations. We really need a theme and a purpose that we can come out of this month and we can have some policy direction. Just, and I would say the same for Hispanic uh, Month or Asian Pacific Month or whatever. You know, it has to have a purpose not just this this I don't know this pomp and circumstance and then at the end of that month nothing is resolved nothing is solved nothing is improved nothing is better for future generations so that's why I say we just really have to sit and look and ask ourselves who's dominating the narrative for this thing I mean is it the NAACP you know they were found by white liberal progressive elites you know W.B. Du Bois ended up you know being an avowed communist and renouncing his American citizenship so I'm not really, you know, hot on, on that group. Uh, the National Urban League, well, things are falling apart in the ur- inner cities and the urban areas. So who are the ones that are setting a, a path forward? And, and, you know, President Trump has a great opportunity to do that. I mean, it would be good if he had some, some folks up there, get some of the Congressional Black Caucus, get some black conservatives, get Walter Williams or Thomas Sowell, some of these great names, and sit down and talk about what, what can we do better? Uh, because we've turned a corner with the unemployment. Now, now, what can we do for education? What can we do for entrepreneurship? Yeah, keep the wind, the momentum of those things going and celebrate that and encourage. You know, I, I would like to see the black community at the end of February feeling inspired. Yeah. Yeah, that's what the month should be about. But it has to be inspired for a specific thing that has a policy uh, solution that can continue that that way. But then you can come back next year and say, look what we did in this past year. Look yeah. at look at how education has improved. Or look at how we're re- working to restore the family. Look at how we're reducing, you know, the amount of uh, abortions in the black community. I mean, 19 million black babies have been murdered since Roe v. Wade, 1973. That's genocidal. Okay. And no one's talking talking about it. I mean, everyone wants to go out and talk about slavery and reparations and all this stuff. 19 million babies have been killed. To me, that's, that's, that's a tragedy. I guess what that says to me is women's rights trump 
black rights. Fair point. And when you when you say the right to do what, I, I love it when I hear people say a woman's right to choose to choose to do what, <laughs> and and it comes back to one single thing: you're choosing to 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 murder, to take an unborn life, and and I don't think that that is a, an alienable. That's not one of the inalienable rights that you know our Creator gave to us. The first inalienable right is life, and and again, what a great topic to have in Black History Month is the the loss of 19 million Black. 19 million black kids will never know the dream of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Indeed. No, I agree with you, and that breaks my heart. And the sad part of that is, is that um, this is taught to be empowering, to, to have this choice, whether as a black person or as a woman. It's empowering to have the choice to terminate a life. And what's really sad about that is that this, to, in order to do that, personhood has to be disqualified. And for the black community that is so, you know, still embittered about slavery, well, that was the justification for slavery too. You're not a person. So therefore we can make you property, we can enslave you, do whatever we want. And it's the same argument that's put upon the unborn child. It's not a person, you know, so yeah. for it's my property, I can do with it whatever I want. And, um, you know, and, and, and you're exactly right, you know, Alan, it's like these things, they, need, they do need to be talked about. And, uh, and they're deep questions. They're deep questions that need to be answered. And usually they're answered with defensiveness and they're answered with denial. And oh, just to answer your question, uh, uh, Tracy, yes, we, we actually did have parades and stuff like that. I think we still have them. I grew up around black history. My mom, per se, and this was in San Bernardino, right? We lived in like the hoods of San Bernardino. Uh, um, you know, and my mom herself was black history queen two years in a row. Uh, you know, we had dinner with Muhammad Ali, you know, and so it's like, I, I, was, I was raised around, I was steeped in it. And it's not something that I have like uh, any sort of animus towards. This is like Alan, you know, what says, it's like, okay, we, 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 did, we address this. And for some reason, after all this time, there still seems to be this state of discontent that we're in, even though we have this month of inspiration and celebration. Okay, well, what have we done with it? Where's, where's the proof of our fruits uh, that we've really done something with this month? And when, when in a short amount of time, when we see black unemployment coming down and we see these corners being turned, we're gonna have the Congressional Black Caucus sit there and turn up their nose or, or, or not <laughs> applaud or anything like that. I mean, it's a brilliant point, Alan. It's like, I, I just like we, you know, we're trying to say, if we're going to have it, let it really be fruitful inspiration. What are we actually gonna do with it and really educate people about the accomplishments that we've had for mankind, not just as a statement to say, hey, look at what I've done as a black person. It's, look, I've done this, this is for mankind, I'm glad I can contribute to it, and that in itself, the humility of doing that is what will bring them exaltation. I think that the argument was that um, they didn't like that Trump was taking credit for it. But I think that your hatred towards Trump needs to be um, less than your love for that accomplishment and what that how that affects the the community that you're you know supposed to be representing and that's that's the point that you just brought up to see was that you know this is about booing the other team yeah and, and even yeah. you know if the other team throws an interception and you end up scoring you know i'm pretty happy that they threw the interception but here you have the the hatred of an individual, Donald Trump, is now become a hatred of anything that can be accomplished and achieved, anything that can be tied back and related to him. Uh, and so therefore, we will, will, will reject this good news because it came from someone that we hate. So in an essence, what has ended up happening is we're starting to hate America and we're starting to hate ourselves because this guy's working hard to do, you know, to do something good. And, and that's just not a good state uh, to be in. You know, I had a, I remember, you can look it up, uh, the former chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, Representative Emanuel Cleaver out of Kansas City, Missouri. I mean, he recognized how bad things were for the black community under President Obama. And he said these words, he said that if there was anyone else sitting in the White House, we'd be protesting. Mm. What does that tell you? Yeah. I mean, you're going to give deference to a person based upon their skin color. And so it comes right back to what we're talking about Black History Month. You know, Dr. Martin Luther King talked about the content of character, not color of skin. And so if color of skin is the, the, the reason why we're going to give you a pass, 
then we truly have not achieved anything. We truly have not overcome. We truly have not, you know, lived the dream that Dr. King talked about. He wants character. He wants righteous governance. And, and you know what? It doesn't matter what your skin color is. So I think that's a huge thing that we need to overcome here in America. And, you know, we need to get that straight within yeah. our black community. Yes. I'm and I the black unemployment is down. What, yeah. what better thing could there be? Right. And I think that um, talking about content of character, we have to, as white people, that's one of the frustrations is if I judge somebody on the content of that character and that person happens to be black, I'm a racist. And it's like, but where am I, what am, what am I supposed to do? It's like, it doesn't mean that, you know, I don't think Martin Luther King meant, that, you know, the leapfrog into now you can't have any judgment of me because I'm black. Right. Well, that's the that default. Yeah. That's the default response. If, if you don't vote for Hillary Clinton, you're sexist. If you don't right. like Barack Obama, his policies, then that's because you're racist. If, if you're black and you don't like Obama's policy, you're an uncle Tom, you're a sellout, you're an Oreo. If, uh, if you don't agree with an LGBT lifestyle, not saying that you hate people, but you don't agree with that lifestyle, you're a homophobe. If you stand up and speak out about Islamic jihadism and terrorism, you're an Islamophobe. Everything is a phobia or is. And what that ends up being is a means by which folks try to get you to shut up. It is a means by which folks try to censor free speech in the United States of America. And, and again, this is just a very dangerous path because we're going down this this thing, you know, and zone knows identity politics. And the, the best way to keep people from speaking out against identity politics is to demonize, denigrate, and demean them. And, and that's what this name calling is all about. And I I just, I just despise it. It's, it's horrible. It's very frustrating. It's very frustrating because what it's become is instead of we're attacking problems, we become attacking people. Mm-hmm. And that's why nothing gets solved. And I think that that's the problem. And I, uh, Zoe has a great saying, and I don't know if it's your own, but I'm going to give you credit because you're the one I heard it from, is that diversity and divide share the same root. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I love that. It is. And I think that. Thank you. Thank you. It, it, yeah. So it's, it's, it's just a friendly form of segregation is, is what we've ended up you know, doing. And, uh, you know, and, and y'all, you, you, you bring up Martin Luther King. And, uh, you know, the thing about it is, you know, with the black community, you know, Democrats were the ones who were harassing him. And ultimately, it was a Democrat who murdered him. And it's like, you got the black who actually lets the Democrat Party get away with murder. You know, so and, you know, but to and I'm, and I'm bringing that up because do, you know, Martin Luther King, you know, he did want us to judge people, you know, by character and, you know, not by color of skin. And, it, you know, and the thing is, it's OK to recognize people for their different colors. You know, like, when I think of like, you know, Tracy, when I think of like Tracy, I'm not thinking, hey, my white friend Tracy. And when I think of, I'm not thinking my black friend, Alan, you're, you're, you're my friend. Right. And the only time your color would matter to me is if you came up missing. It's like, uh, yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's like and I need to give attention. You know, but to, to be a colorblind society, you know, I think even the Lord himself, when he made us the way he made us, he still wanted us to have an appreciation for these differences. Like, you know, if I may, you know, I'd like to read like, you know, Revelation 15, 4 through 5. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you. The Lord doesn't mind us saying, hey, you know, yeah, I, I created different colors and it's all beautiful. But when you start judging people by it, the only way that God's gonna judge is whether you chose his son or not. You know, and if, if you've done mm-hmm. cool with me, no matter what color you are, but I'm still gonna see it and I'm not gonna, but I'm not gonna make a judgment about you for it. You know, um, I was doing some research on like race and um, we are one species that and all races share 99.99% of the same genetic materials. Isn't that beautiful? It, it, I mean, it's absolutely great. We have more in common than we have in difference. Yes. And, you know, when we talk about race, race is um, to find an ethnicity is the identification with a particular race, culture, or religious group. But think about how many of the same different races share the same culture and religion, you know? So it's like, it's so more blended mm-hmm. than, um, 
than I think people want to realize. It isn't so black and white, <laughs> you know. When you bring up, uh, you know, that uh, those genetics, you know, when we would, if we really want to get down to the history of the human race, um, this is our history. Dirt. <laughs> That's the thing that we all share in common. And you can't refute that because everything that is found in the soil is found in every living organism. That's what we're made of. We're made from it. Yeah. You, if you grab you a handful of dirt, you will find what's composed of dirt, you will find in the living organisms. That's just what you're gonna find. So there, and there is nothing that can refute that, really. So that's our history. And <laughs> aside from us being made of a finite material, that's our future. That's our history and that's our future. So it's like, I think we should all have that in common and celebrate that, that we're all dirty. <laughs> well, you know, down south we did used to eat dirt as kids. So. Oh, you mud pie? Did you have yeah, mud pie? Mud yeah, mud right dirt. on. Wait a minute. If we came from dirt and we were eating dirt, would that be cannibalism? Ugh. <laughs> okay, so I have a question for you guys. African American or black? What's the what, what are we oh, supposed to that's very that's very simple for me i i refer to myself as an american black man and the oh, reason why i don't say african-american because you know i i used to live down in south florida and i had many friends who had uh, come to the united states of america migrated here uh, legally uh they were from the former rhodesia they were from south africa and guess what they were white or you have people from egypt morocco or ethiopia kenya you know they are coming from the continent of africa they were African, and now they have gotten American citizenship. Citizenship. They're truly African American, and so once again, you know, I am proud of the fact that I'm an American black man. And, and, and you know, my wife that I've been married to for 28 years, she was born and raised in Jamaica. I mean, she's a Jamaican American, and, and she's proud of that. So I think that again, instead of us trying to craft these narratives or craft these identities to try to give us some, you know. Uh, fill in some hole that, that, that we found empty. We should just accept, you know, who we are here in this great nation and the accomplishments and the achievements of so many great previous American blacks instead of trying to redefine ourselves in, in some other hyphenated manner. Uh, so, you know, black is fine with me. So okay. it's Black History Month. I'm good to go. <laughs> okay. So, uh, where are you, what you, say you? Is there a third option on that? Because uh, uh, now, you know me, I'm, I'm going to... Yeah. I'm going to try to get biblical on fill it. Fill in the blank. Technically. There's a fill in the blank. Technically, I'm a Kushite. All right. And the reason why I say that is because when you have the races that are. Is that north of Alabama? <laughs> Maybe a little bit. West of the north. Mississippi. Uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm Kushite. So when, in the Bible, you got, um, you got the sons of Noah. You got Ham. And Ham, when you break it down, his name means burnt brown. That's what Ham means. Now, Ham's son was Cush. And Kush actually means black. So you have your first complexions that are defined in the Bible. And, and just for the record, for anybody who tries to stigmatize the black race as a cursed race, that was Canaan. That was not Cush. The son of Ham was Canaan. He was cursed, not Cush. Okay, so technically I'm a Cush. Cush in the Greek means Ethiopian. So from Ethiopia is where you're gonna get your Negroid, so to speak, black folks. And just like Alan said, Africa is a continent. It doesn't really describe who black people are. Africa, uh, the African continent shares a lot of different races. It's Africa is, is it's a continent. So if it's like, well, which, which blacks are you talking about? You talking about Ghana? You talking about Kenya? You talking about you know, uh, you know, Ethiopia? Which one, which one are you talking about? So at the core, really, I'm a descendant of Kush. I'm a Kushite, but American black would do. I like American black. <laughs> I like that. I like American first. Uh, exactly. We're Americans. You know, if we're going yeah. to the character, the characteristic of me being American first would be, well, I'd, I'd like to think that I'm a patriot. If I'm going to move to a yeah. country, I'm going to embrace what it is to live in that country, that culture, so on and so forth. If I'm going to be in it. Now, the thing is, you know, America, I didn't choose to be here, but I've chosen to stay here. <laughs> so, it's like, so anybody who's like talking about, you know, where they you know, were taken from or anything like that, it's like, y'all, you've been free to go and, you know, make your pilgrimage to that place at any time. I myself, I choose to stay here. If I'm going to stay here, I'm not going to just go on and keep on lamenting and cursing about what it is that I think that I don't have. So what's the task? What's the marching orders? 
What do well, we do with it? Well, I think the task and purpose, uh, it, it, it is so important for us to uh, go out and say, what is it? What is the active thing that we want to do? And I think that the most important active thing, two active things, two tasks, educate and inform. Uh, and what is the purpose of educating and informing ourselves as a community and as, as the great United States of America? Because if you don't know from whence you came, you're not going to know where you are. You certainly are not going to figure out where you're heading. Uh, and that is what we have to do. And so I, I think it's so important that we start to identify these problems and we start to educate and inform so that we can solve these problems. We can rectify these situations. If not, you're just going to be a hamster on a wheel. You're expending a lot of energy, but you're not ever going anywhere. So I would say that task one, task two, educate and inform the purpose so that we can create a, a better society, a better America, not just for one specific community, but for all communities here in this country. All right, y'all, I want to give thanks to and sign off for my buddies, Tracy Melchior and Alan West. I hope y'all enjoyed the thoughts that we shared on the topic. And before you leave the Zoloft, here's a dose from Zoe to go. Indeed, education is of high importance, but education of what? Education in America is as available as Netflix. I offer that the problem isn't lack of education. The problem is what's being passed off as education. People are being indoctrinated and socially engineered under the guise of education. And this education is hardly in short supply. The campaign of collectivist conditioning is well-funded. The Democrats still have their brain chains on most of the black community, and of course, many in general. The Democrat party, the party that didn't want black folks to be educated in the first place, is now the party that's controlling what black folks receive as education. And it's a program of prejudice that keeps people blind to Democrat evil because Democrats have them focused on hating others. For education to flourish, it's more than a problem of being taught what to think or how to think. The problem is in the atrophy of the ability to discern truth, just the way godless liberals like it. And for constructive education to be really beneficial, people have to see the truth about who's teaching them. And it's mostly Democrats. But the spell of prejudice is powerful, and keeping blacks prejudiced is how Democrats keep control over them. In full satanic form, all the Democrats had to do was make an accusation. Republicans are racist. The party switched sides. Mm -hmm. And the spell of the accusing Democrats, the actual culprits, is cast, leaving people blind and deaf to the truth. Like what I've been saying for years, you can't use a so-called party switch as an excuse. Black folks had already started switching before the so-called party switch. So what was black folks' excuse for siding with the enemy then? Your excuse is about as good as Adam and Eve's excuse for siding with the accuser. Malcolm X was already rebuking black folks for siding with the Democrats before the so-called party switch. He had his criticisms for conservatives, but he had a special disdain for liberals and warned black folks about liberals especially, which means he was giving this warning before the so-called ideological switch too. So the party switch and the ideological switch is bogus. Black folks was already switching over the prospect of being fed by the very party that was staying in the way of them feeding themselves and their abilities in the first place. Liberalism is just another form of camouflage for the Democrat party. I've been trying to tell y'all, this is why the Democrat founded KKK calls themselves the invisible empire. Who do you think is running the schools, the music that you listen to, the TV shows that you watch, the movies that you watch? telling you to hate the party that liberated black folks from the party that was determined to deprive black folks of their God-given rights. Economic empowerment will skyrocket when black folks stop listening to Democrats who stoked their flames of bitterness with this idea that they're owed something. Democrats have always been the party of oppression and blaming other people for it. It works like a charm to see people do it every day. Do somebody dirty and blame somebody else for it. Democrats have been doing that since the 1800s. Yes, dang it, they're doing it today. Didn't y'all hear the letter I read by John Wilkes Booth? Economic development is stunted in the black community because they keep letting Democrats control whatever wealth they make. Their communities are run by Democrats. Blacks will support the Democrat policies of regulations, fees, and taxation because they get the pseudo satisfaction that they're sticking it to Republicans. The party that the Democrats have programmed them to hate so much. Even though Republicans aren't even voted in to represent their communities, they're made to believe that these phantom Republicans have the power and are at fault for their communities. So out of baseless hatred for Republicans, they give Democrats power over their economy. And they stay shackled, and shackled to a false hope that Democrats are gonna make others pay. But in the meantime, I guess they have the pseudo satisfaction of hating Republicans. 
But like Alan West said, nobody, meaning nobody in the Democrat Party, wants you hearing this. They really don't want to have the conversation. If anything, they just want you to sit there and suffer through their accusatory vent. Why do you feel like you haven't overcome? Why do you feel like you're being held back or held down when you feel it down in your bones and in your soul that you could take off as fast and as far as anybody else? Well, it's because you got these brain chains, these weighted shackles placed on you by Democrats. The weight they use is anger. The power of the anger is slander. Y'all stop listening to them and black history will take on a whole new meaning. Being black in America will take on a better and brighter new meaning. Heck, you'll even get a kick out of just calling yourself an American. Like Tracy and Allen said, you'll be more inspired. Next year's Black History Month should show that you're miles further than we were last year. The real power is in inspiring people, not making people feel guilty. But your economy won't grow if you buy into the Democrat idea that you're owed an economy. The Democrats are the ones who made it an institution to rob black folks of their rights in the first place. And they keep you shackled and under their control. It's an oppressive lie told by the party of oppression that blacks from years past broke free from. Those black folks that we've long celebrated during Black History Month broke free from Democrats. If you really honor their memory, break free from who they broke free from. Right on, right on. Thank you so much for hanging out in the Zoloft with the clown prince of conservatism, yours truly. And I hope you'll visit my website, bronzesurfermedia.com, and check out other stuff that I'm up to. I got books there, I got music there, I got teleplay ideas that I'm working on, playbacks to my live streams. Come around them tabs, you might find some other stuff that you dig because I try to rock the gospel in the culture. You might even find that tip jar, because even though the message is free, delivering it ain't. So be a saint and help brother keep gas in that delivery truck. 